Good morning, afternoon, and evening from beautiful Paris, France. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth annual Airport PRM Leadership Conference. We have an amazing two days ahead of us. Five years ago, I approached Roman Today, the CEO of Ozion, and proposed that we start a conference that would open up a forum for the leaders involved with providing services for passengers with reduced mobility in airports, a safe place to share with one another and find common ground on all aspects of assisted service delivery. The first year we had 25 participants and we grew each year to 65 participants last year. This year, uh, we have over 400 uh, participants coming in from over 62 countries. Uh, the challenges ahead are huge, but I see this group as more than capable of rising to the challenge that faces us all. So once again, for those of you that continue to arrive, welcome one and welcome all. Let's start with a little housekeeping. Uh, questions can be asked in the, in the question box, and if possible, they will be answered during each session. If we're unable to answer because of time restraints, then we will answer them when the conference is completed. Uh, you can also, during certain, uh, certain presentations, uh, we'll ask you to raise your hand and we'll bring in your live voice. The GoToWebinar platform does not support live closed captioning. We will make sure the recordings have the closed captioning included after the event. With that, I would like to introduce my co-host today, Mr. Roberto Castiglioni, a veteran of the Airport PRM Leadership Conference and a strong advocate for the improvement of access and services for assisted passengers. With an incredible resume that includes being a member of the UK Civil Aviation Authority Access to Air Travel Panel, the EasyJet Special Advisory Group, chairing the aging population and PRM, uh, PRM's track at the Passenger Terminal Conference, and he was also the first chair for the Heathrow Access Advisory Group. The list continues, but as I do, I've gone on far too long. Welcome, Roberto. Thank you, William. Good day, everyone, and welcome from London, United Kingdom. Um, William, you're right. We are in a, in, in a challenging situation, but this challenging situation presents a lot of opportunities. First and foremost, in an industry that is so fast-paced, we have the time to stop, analyze, think, and overhaul the system. Why we need to overhaul it? Because we need to move from the uh, seamless experience to the dignified experience, an experience where the person is at the center of the action and his, and his, his or her needs are catered to the best possible, in the best possible way. Now, of course, that relies, like any solid house, relies on rock solid foundations. And information technology is the foundation of this service, not just seen as dispatching agents or, or, or putting in requests, but also interacting with all the other stakeholders to ensure that everybody in, involved is on top of the information and therefore on top of the game. This translates in, in driving efficiencies just by working better and working together. Now, as I, as you, as I just pointed out, uh, this industry thrives on, uh, on, on timeliness. And uh, well, I'm gonna give it back to you, William. Great. Um, thank you very much, Roberto. And thank you for joining us today and helping us to moderate and host uh, this year's conference. Um, our first speaker, is Martin Sibley. Uh, Martin is the co-founder of the Purple Goat Agency, a flu an influencing marketing company. Martin makes regular mainstream media appearances and is an avid traveler. His many travels have inspired his memoir entitled, Everything is Possible. An accomplished entrepreneur, Martin co-founded Accommable, a platform for disabled travelers. It has since been acquired by Airbnb. It is once again my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Mr. Martin Sibley. Martin? Hello there. Thank you very much, William. It's uh, great, great to be here today. And um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, one second.
Okay. Let me know if there's any problem from a viewing perspective, but hopefully um, that should still be okay. Um, so the, my slides are there, how to change the world, which is uh, my sort of general presentation that I am, I've done quite a lot of speaking at, at conferences in person, obviously prior to COVID-19 when uh, things got a bit different. And um, over the course of this year, I've done a fair few presentations virtually. And so I'm really excited to be here today and uh, talk around all things air travel. As William mentioned, I'm an avid traveler with a disability. And um, I think really that my job for, for this session is to, to help open things up following William and Roberto. And I think just instill that, that passion and motivation and inspiration for what whatever sort of companies and whatever roles that you're involved in, where you're, you know, wherever you're viewing from in the world, um, to remind us all why we are so passionate about the inclusion of disabled people when it comes to air travel. And so I'm definitely going to bring that perspective of a disabled person and that perspective of a, of a disabled passenger, if you like. Um, but also, as William also mentioned, the Purple Goat Agency is something I started during lockdown and it's as a specialist disability marketing agency and some of the other bits that uh, we'll get onto in a minute. There's definitely that sort of business and marketing perspective around disability and inclusion that I think for, for many of you will, will be interesting and useful. So um, I know some of you um, know me quite well in general and I've seen some of my uh, live streams and um, yeah, generally um, maybe, maybe even seen these um, some version of these slides but I think for you for those of you that have done there'll still be some bits that I'm sure you'll learn from from today's talk I will be making it very specific to air travel and mix it up where possible but I know a lot of you watching um, won't have seen um, my talks before, um, particularly the sort of live uh, conference keynote talks. And so, yeah, obviously I'm going to give you a little bit more of that, the backstory, just to, to help uh, bring up to speed with some of my perspective. So in terms of growing up with a disability, that's me aged about six or seven years old. I have a genetic disability, a neuromuscular disability called spinal muscular atrophy. And what that means in day-to-day -day terms is that I'm always um, in a in my wheelchair, um, and I, you know, my waking hours, I'm in a power wheelchair. I have a team of care uh, supporters that are able to help with things like, um, you know, get getting a bath and getting dressed and preparing food. And so, you know, physically, I'm very very limited um, in terms of my physical abilities. But um, I think, you know, something I pride myself on is the the sort of positive attitude and the the can-do attitude that I, um, yeah, generally would would sort of have and stand for, um, but yeah, physically that's been my situation since birth. And so obviously, as we move into air travel and the needs, that that becomes uh, sort of more specific barriers, shall we say? Um, a few horror stories over the years, but obviously lots of positive travels as well. And uh, back to the point of why I've got a personal uh, passion to make air travel better from that perspective. So another part, um, having sort of explained the, the medical side of my disability, is independence and freedom are big values of mine. And that's me uh, driving with adapted controls there in the car. Um, and that's um, something I've actually unfortunately had to give up about a year ago in terms of actual driving. I've still got an adaptive vehicle where I can be driven but stay in my wheelchair, but um, this picture is also just more metaphorical for that general way that I want to be fully with sort of choice and control in my day-to-day -day life. And so even if I need that support from other people, um, I'm still very much in control cognitively. And so the way that that becomes possible for me is very much around um, these four points of the care, which sort of touched upon at the beginning, equipment, so like my wheelchair, I have a hoist that lifts me in and out of the wheelchair so that people don't have to physically lift me. Accessible housing is obviously a big part of independence 
and transport and you know that that goes for taxis buses cars trains etc but very much as we're talking about today um it's around the the need to be able to move freely which is something we talk about quite generally with air travel it's a, a fundamental pillar that it enables us as people to move around the world freely and i suppose um for, for disabled people it's not always the case and i know that's why we're all um at this conference to do our bit to to move that forward and create more solutions and innovate and disrupt where necessary so that everybody has those same opportunities for travel and so yeah having sort of looked at the, the health medical side and then the sort of inputs that i need um, to be more independent there's then the external part as well um, and i sort of touched upon it in a sense when i talked about barriers to air travel but when we look more broadly at so there's a thing called the social model that particularly in the uk has been a fundamental political model that helped the disability activists the political activism in sort of the 70s 80s 90s to win a lot more rights for disabled people and that all was built on the social model and what that really speaks to is that using myself an example i have an impairment or a medical condition as i've mentioned already a couple of times previously called spinal muscular atrophy that's my impairment but actually under the social model disability or being disabled is from societal barriers and so that may sound a bit abstract and a bit complicated but to give some examples uh, the environment is something that has barriers so when there is steps that disables me but when there is a ramp or a lift i am enabled i'm no longer disabled attitudes is another big one so if someone presumes and makes presumptions that i'm you know less able to speak for myself or maybe to do a particular job then again that attitudinal barrier disables me and when people just are curious to get to know me as martin and they don't have stereotypes just because i'm in a wheelchair i'm no longer disabled and third along the same lines but procedures can disable and i think this is a very apt one when we look at air travel that when there are various procedures as you know there is in life no one's knocking that we, we all do need procedures but what we really need is procedures that include everyone and don't accidentally exclude and i mean a, a typical example i give of a procedural barrier is having to book a train ride more than 24 hours in advance when everybody else can get on a train spontaneously so that procedure or that process is a barrier and when there isn't a procedural barrier i'm no longer disabled a couple other quick points around self-esteem and confidence i've always said that in the past to talks particularly with disabled people that we have to have self-esteem and confidence for change and the skills and knowledge for change but i think the more i'm now working with governments businesses and charities that's definitely shifted more that it's not just disabled people need those things it's every stakeholder and what we want to do is be able to nurture and grow those parts in everybody to feel able to, to make change for inclusion so yeah on that personal level when the the health side is, you know is understood and okay the independent living side the inputs are okay and obviously there are still barriers indeed there are still challenges to health and independent living but broadly when i've looked after health independent living and inclusion not that overcoming those barriers the world the world is our oyster um, and so William mentioned I've written a book about my travel so I'm not going to go into lots of details because we are um, as Roberto said this is a industry all about time and I've got about five minutes left for my talk and a few more slides to get through but I mean ultimately the, the top left is when I went to Australia on my first solo trip as in not with family but with a couple of personal care assistants um, and the second one on the right top right is with my friend Shrin and we did a California road trip that's in San Francisco bottom left is Barcelona one of my favorite cities culturally but also from an inclusion perspective it's phenomenally good 
for wheelchair users such as myself. And the bottom right is with my fiance Kasha in Tokyo. And we happened to bump into or arranged to meet a very old friend of mine there, Haruka, from school. But the trip was with the Japanese government. Um, so all of those stories are, are in the book if you would like to learn more about it. I've also done lots of adventures. This is a video. Again, it's on YouTube if you want to have a look another time. But um, all about adapted skiing there. And then other adventures are flying a plane, top left. Bottom left is a hot air balloon ride. And on the right was a strange one of tree climbing. But as much as it was called tree climbing, it was basically hanging from very strong ropes from trees in the new forest. But, uh, you know, one of those things to try out maybe once in life. But yeah, as you can see, travel and adventure is a really important thing for me. And, and to reiterate my earlier point, I think that's this, you know, why do we all work so hard? Well, if I wasn't able to fly, I wouldn't have been able to do all of these things. And as we'll come on to see in a minute, I also wouldn't have been able to showcase to other disabled people and get them to think about the kind of things that they maybe want to do in their life, whether that is certain travels and adventures as well. Okay, so um, again, it's sort of, I've done it as a chronology, this sort of health, independent living, um, you know, being able to be included and overcome the barriers. And then now I'm talking about giving back and contribution. But I, I think we'll all agree that in life, they're always ongoing and concurrent. But essentially with those other things that had happened, it was really important that I could give back. So I started blogging to share about these experiences, co-founded the magazine to give a platform for other disabled people to speak to. Um, a comable, which William mentioned, was sold to Airbnb. I've done a lot of consultancy, and as we've said a couple of times about Purple Goat as well. So just that broad point about being able to, to share the sort of articles and videos about traveling by plane and about going on these holidays and adventures. So there's some generic slides I've got around the business case really for disability, the, the spending power of disabled people, how a lot of brands are a bit scared of um, engaging and speaking with disabled people. I think a lot more people at this conference are, uh, are less uh, fearful, but I think there's still an important takeaway that we should all feel empowered to talk and have discussions and overcome differences and bridge the different businesses and parts of the aviation puzzle and very much put disabled people, the disabled passenger, at the centre of that conversation. And that's something that we at Purple Goat help facilitate a lot with sort of research and uh, marketing activations and all that, that good stuff. So just in terms of quickly for two minutes here, looking at some sort of solutions, I think we're all aware of the barriers of aviation and, and disabled people. Obviously, me as a wheelchair user is different from a visually impaired person or a neurodiverse person, but ultimately we're trying to overcome barriers. I think onboard access is a big thing, so we need to look at staff feeling confident. I know a lot of people have lifted me onto flights that have been very nervous, which made me nervous, and that's where sometimes things can go a bit wrong. So. There's a thing about the, the people being empowered there, but obviously generally making the layout of planes a bit more better for wheelchair users and for disabled people. Information is a massive one, so that it's very clear before the flight even takes place what the processes are, what the touch points are, what sort of things people need to remember. Um, and let's think of information not as reams and reams of text, but maybe we can provide information in more fun and creative formats. Customer service is the pillar for me for everything. I think disabled or not, we just want air travel passengers to be having a customer service experience that is positive and we build in the, the, the access needs into that. And I think a big part is that top down commitment. And that's not just the big regulatory authorities or the big airlines, which of course it is, but it's also just in every you know, company, even startup businesses, even individuals as well. But yeah, it is about that bigger, more in a hierarchical sense, that that top-down commitment. That's yeah, perfect timing. 
that is the end of my presentation. I hope you all enjoy all the amazing talks to come uh, today and tomorrow. And I will be back on briefly in a couple of hours um, for another little bit of a segment of today's conference. But yeah, please really get stuck into this amazing content, be inspired, get creative. And hopefully at the end of these two days, we can all get out there and make a load more change, particularly with the opportunities that I think COVID-19, as difficult as this year has been, does provide us. So thank you for your time and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Martin. Don't, don't go just yet, please. Uh, I would like to thank you again for being uh, able to put the, the, the real reason why we are all here together at, at the front and center of the discussion. But maybe William wants to chime in for a second. Well, that, that was fantastic, Martin. And, and it really, I, I think, encompassed uh, what we're all here for today, um, which is that uh, though we're, we, we are serving passengers with assisted needs in our airports, um, I think that you know, when, when we encounter someone like you who is making a difference, not just in the accessible world, but overall, you are a busy guy. You're moving, you're out there. And um, you know, the idea that you should be able to arrive to an airport, go through the airport and get the service uh, that, that you need to arrive where, where you want to be, uh, it's it should be second nature to all of us. So um, when when you travel, do you do you take your um, your mobile device with you? And and what's your experience with that? Did, sorry, did you say mobile device? Yeah, your your uh, personal chair. Yeah, the chair. Yeah, sorry, I was mobile joking. Device, yeah. to a smartphone or something. Yeah, no, with the wheelchair, absolutely. Um, I I literally am always needing to be in the chair, and mine is very. Uh, personalized in terms of the seating and the, the general support and comfort so um, I do actually have what so I have a newer chair and the older chair is a sort of spare that I fly with because of bad experiences with having damaged wheelchairs um, so I, I wouldn't at the current way of things um, with you know getting the chair on and off the aircraft I wouldn't take my newer chair for fear of damage um, but I do take my own personal one with me, nonetheless. Great. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I look forward to have you uh, with us again in a couple of hours to further share your valued insight. Uh, and as you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of the way you can portray things in such a normal way, in such a natural way, in a way that we all understand that we're all the same. And when we travel, we're all customers, regardless of our needs. Thank you again, Martin. Absolutely. It is my pleasure now to introduce Tariq Kamal. He is the Vice President and Airport of Expansion Project Interface at Terminal 1 Operations at India's busiest airport, Indira Gandhi International Airport in New Delhi. Tariq is a professional with over 25 years of rich experience in aviation, safety, airport constructions and other infrastructure projects, change management, emergency planning and business continuity management. I hope Tariq is going to join me soon. I know he's, he's, he's there. But in, in the meantime, I have to say that just to give you the idea, uh, New Delhi Airport had, had 67.3 million passengers in 2019. That's to give you the size of the challenges that Tariq faces every day. Here he is. The floor is yours, Tariq. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a very good uh, I would say afternoon to all of you. Without further ado, I will start get into the things, my topic, because uh, being conscious of the time limitations and uh, I will go straight away into my presentation. So the journey starts that I am a by profession and by education, I am a civil engineer. And uh, I joined the aviation business as a constructor, as a, as a construction team uh, person. Going forward, after making this uh, two airports, one at Hyderabad and one at Delhi, I joined them as a uh, operations man. And thereafter, I I have uh, been uh, part of various facets of um, of uh, operations, and um, uh, it has been a wonderful journey so far. So I will share with you my presentation where I'm showing that all the good things that we did during 
the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, when it's we went into the lockdown on 24th of March this year, uh, we were uh, closed for operations for a few days, but then there was a demand rising by various countries and airlines and consulates to do some flights for their uh, tourists and people who were stuck in India and they wanted to bring them back to their country. So uh, with this, um, we had to restart the operations, but the enemy was nowhere to be seen. And uh, that is the COVID virus. And we had uh, to work our way through the government, the regulator, the medical agencies, the airlines. Nobody was sure what to do and how to do. The process has evolved over the over the over such a long time, I would say uh, months. And then we were all learning as we uh, as we were living our lives through. The and uh, though all the other teams in the airport was having work from home, but the terminal operations, airside operations, fire teams, we were all there. And just in the crosshairs, it was the terminal team that is my team, and we were we were managing the operations in the terminal. So um, I uh, will just take you through that what all we did uh, that earned us a coveted award by this uh, safe travel barometer, which is one of the uh, which is one of the companies which does the uh, grading of the airports on this uh, on the safety of travel. So we were the second safest airport in the world. Uh, after Changi, and then we were sharing this with uh, Frankfurt and some other airports. Uh, Delhi Airport also backed uh, the ACI SQ award for the best airport in the 40 million uh, passengers ca category in Asia Pacific region. And then uh, we we uh, we are the largest airport in India with the uh, in the capital of the city uh, capital of the country. Uh, what were the measures that we have done? They are like um, we had UV tunnels, uh, which were um, placed throughout the airport, some social distancing markings, which were put on the UV tunnels. We went to the extent that we put it into our air changing and air handling units. Uh, we had the HEPA filters fixed into them. We, some, uh, we had some 700 UV lamps fixed, fixed into the uh, air, air circulation units. We uh, had social distancing markings, dispensation of PPEs, some hygiene things, everything. So we will go one by one. This is our terminal, beautiful terminal building. Uh, we had for the PRM phones, so social distancing and uh, markings there. I'll just uh, show you some uh, of the, uh, the chairs in the forecourt. We had to have some social distancing, so the middle chair was not to be used. As we go further, there were um, we provided some uh, counters and queues because the government came up with the guideline that you have to give a self declaration form before you enter the terminal. And there was an application which also had to be loaded, so free Wi Fi was given in the poor court, also, though we had the free Wi Fi inside the terminal so that people can download the application and give their self declaration. Uh, all the boarding passes we had uh, to show before we enter the terminal. So uh, the uh, self scan and fly queues, which were uh, more of them had to be brought to the forecourt because it became a norm that the passengers will not go into the terminal with the ticket. They will go with the, uh, with the boarding pass uh, because it had to be a touchless experience. The QR code had to be scanned everywhere at all the entry points so that they enter into the terminal just by scanning the QR codes. So that's why all the boarding cards had to be generated right into the forecourt. Uh, we had to put a lot of uh, uh, we, we all the trolleys had to be sanitized and doing it manually was different difficult. So we put a trolley tunnel where the trolleys were to be taken in. They they got sanitized with the UV uh, this thing and also we had to spray uh, at the at the key points to get them uh, sanitized going forward this was the shield which we put through between the at the entry gates between the security and the uh, passenger where they could show their boarding card before we put in the before we put in the uh, boarding card scanners which which gave them yes or no to enter the terminal. 
that all over we had to put the signage to tell people that you have to be doing social distancing, you not come too close to each other. Uh, see the chairs again with all the markings done. Here I'm showing the uh, cost machines which are giving you the back tag, which are giving you the boarding cards. It was also a touchless experience just by scanning your boarding card QR code. You get both the things which you, al you have already taken out in the four codes. So you to get the back tag, you have to scan your boarding card. Uh, the check-in counters, the tensor barriers, we can see the markings, we can see the floor markings for the uh, for the social distancing. Uh, uh, for the uh, for, to get into the aircraft to have a touchless experience rather than the airline uh, crew uh, airline staff uh, tearing away the boarding cards or scanning it, we rotated. These are simple solutions. We rotated and put it. Uh, the the QR code uh, scanners onto the desk so the passengers could do it on themselves. Uh, this was a international arrival pier. The airport health officer desk was set up where we had to segregate the passengers where they were declaring their uh, uh, RT-PCR reports and the onward travel documents before they were given a go ahead to go on to the immigrations. So automatic in announcements for their queue management was done. Thermal scanners were placed before they entered here. If they, they showed any signs of temperature, they were quarantined and they were taken to a different space through a different passage. You can see here even in uh, entire arrival uh, immigration, we had to put the floor markers. All can be seen on the floor. We had to put the plexiglass between the immigration team and the passengers so that nobody catches um, uh, infection from each other. Uh, even at the baggage belt area, we put all the floor markers, uh, especially uh, so that uh, people are not close to each other. Uh, there were MATVs which were showing uh, advisories, which were showing uh, short films uh, to educate people on social distancing and all the norms to be followed. Uh, uh, the screens also showed this, uh, the advertisement screens also ran the uh, small clippings on, on that. The check-in hall, you can see all the markers. I have also a small, then we put it bilingual because Hindi is the uh, national language. We had to put it Hindi and English both. So that can be seen here. These are the uh, middle seats to be kept vacant for social distancing. These are the fly safe standees giving different aspects of safety and hygiene to be maintained. This is uh, floor markings and I want to show you some small video where we are showing um, where we are showing a, a passenger's journey. Uh, this was uh, constantly run on social media on our Facebook page on Twitter and also it was uh, it shows people how that we can this is the Getting a boarding card from a scan and fly in the four court, you do the UV tunnel scanning for the baggage. This baggage gets uh, uh, disinfected through that. Then you go proceed the uh, terminal entry gate where you check for your temperature. And once the temperature is checked, then you show your boarding card to the uh, security team. Uh, and you also have to show the government's uh, Arogya Setu app, which was giving the go ahead that you are not infected or you have not come into contact with any infected person. Uh, as you go to the check-in count, uh, you go and get your back tags from here. Uh, and you are assisted the back tag again. Uh, then you go to the check-in counters. This is not showing the back tag, I'm sorry. Uh, this takes you to the check-in counters for drop off your bag. Uh, at the, to the staff also, we gave them handheld scanners. It was all touchless and then you just put your bag onto the belt and things are done. The back tag scanner is also scanned and it's done. So for the washrooms, we had the uh, UV tower, which was uh, both at a later stage, we got it through uh, robot uh, operated, remote operated. And for the buying things, we had a Hoi app uh, which through which you can which you can log in and you can buy things uh, all around the terminal. 
So uh, this is the boarding card scanner that I said on the boarding gates, you just scan and you go. Uh, so it was completely touchless experience. As I go forward, we got uh, social distancing markings. Then we made small videos within which were running on our ME TVs, which show the icons in the uh, in the in the airport. We gave our message with this. This is one of the statues, the mudra statue, which shows that you have to wear masks. Then for the mudras. We, we said that you need to wash your hands. So everywhere we were telling people to be conscious of their uh, hygiene. These are small videos which are sent on the social media platform of the dial so that people coming to the airport can see these small videos. Passengers, uh, celebrities also, we joined hand with the celebrities to uh, give messages about uh, safe travel, about social distancing, about IP, and what to do at the airport and how to do at the airport. So all these things added to our preparedness and uh, being successful in, in the airport journey of the passengers so that everything is safe. Not only that, that we opened a RT-PCR, uh, a COVID testing facility, because many of the passengers who were coming to Delhi, we were the first one airport in the world to start that at the airport. Uh, we have we, we set up a lounge in our parking facility, and there we put all the uh, facilities for the passengers to stay for four to six hours, which is taken to get the uh, test reports done. So that was done uh, for the passengers uh, convenient. So uh, the announcements were made at after at a small uh, of the uh, very designated frequencies in both the uh, Hindi and English. So these there was a uh, standard readout for this, which was also repeated on the Avia Vox, which is a uh, automated uh, announcement system. So that's it from me. Any Great. questions I would like to take? Fantastic, Tariq. Thank you very much. I think that um, it's important for everyone to sort of get the context of what, how forward thinking they were uh, in putting putting this together. It would actually be nice, Tariq, if you stayed for a moment. Um, and Roberto, uh, do you have uh, do you have any questions from the audience or from yourself? Yes, we do have we do have a couple of questions. The first one is if it's possible to have a link to the video of the procedures in your airport, and perhaps we can make it available after the conference uh, in in the uh, in the Slack um, um, room uh, that was that was set up for this conference. Uh, also, the presentation because there is a lot of excellent information that you shared. That it, it's it's amazing all the hard work you guys have done, and I think it is inspiring for many who maybe are still wondering how to do it right. So you know, really, you've done a fantastic, tremendous job uh, in in such a short time. I would say there is uh, uh, also a question from the floor. Uh, in the case of people with vision vision reductions or hearing problems. What is your experience and what specific special measures were taken for, with them regarding the physical distance and the no touch restrictions? Yes, uh, the airlines uh, were reaching out to all the people who were um, uh, who required any kind of uh, who required any kind of such uh, just hold on. <laughs> I had put a time, uh, you know, a timer to remind me that I'm always right. there. <laughs> it went off anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, airline were going there. We were taking the manifest and all the requirements of such passengers beforehand. And such passengers used to call us from the forecourt uh, that they have arrived. Uh, a communication was sent to them. And once they reached the forecourt, they were met with and assisted because the traffic was less, manpower was ample, and we could manage this in those times. But thereafter, we have graduated to more uh, scientific-based systems, 
where people can be assisted with respect to uh, by airline and also there is a team a go team which i forgot to mention in my slides which is specially set up to help people with such uh, requirements to take them through to the terminals because uh, this all has evolved there were no codes and there were no uh, manuals by which we could go so we are still evolving i, I would say Apologies to interrupt. I have another question from the floor, and, and this is very actual. Uh, there's a lot of talks about uh, this aspect here in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, what is the face covering policy in India for passengers with special needs unable to wear a face covering? Uh, if you ask me the topic. I know it's a tough topic. Yeah, if you ask me the government regulation, the government regulation doesn't uh, give any allowance to anyone. And if it is such a case and somebody is carrying a uh, certificate from the doctor or because uh, you have to have some document which uh, gives you a which gives you an exception to use that and it is it is uh, uh, honored and in that case we have seen that the airlines provide them with the face shield not the if it is not the face mask they give them the face shield so we have uh, given the body suits we have given the face shield we have given the masks we tried everything there the gloves everything fantastic, fantastic. Thank, you thank you very much um and Please, everyone, continue to ask the questions um, in the text. And uh, when we do have time, we'll, we'll bring in some audio questions as well. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Yeah, thank um, you very much. And uh, it, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Kamuli. Um, she is the manager for people with accessible needs for the Expo 2020 Dubai. Jennifer brings 30 years of experience working with people with access needs. As an accessibility and inclusion professional, she works for Expo 2020 Dubai as the head of accessibility and inclusion to ensure the built digital, social, and sensory environments will offer full accessibility for all people with uh, access needs attending. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Kamuli. Jennifer? Hi there. Uh, have I shared my screen? It says I have, but I don't see the screen myself. You should pop uh, up in a second. Okay. Um, and uh, do you have access for the, uh, the slides as well? Are you putting your slide up? uh yes okay i don't see your video yet let me share my webcam there you are how's that yes there i perfect. am Great. do you see you don't have my screen yet though um i am uh, yes it is up so you just um if you push the uh the button to play the slides then you'll be ready to go you got okay. it all right No, I haven't got my slides yet here. Hang on. Apologies. No problem at all. We can I see, see your, nice. yeah, we can see your slide deck. Uh, it's oh, you, just, you can see it now? Yes. If you, yeah. if you press. We can see it. Yeah. Perfectly. There you go. Yes. You're there up all right now. All right, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. Thank you for the, the introduction. Um, hello, everyone from around the world. Um, I, uh, as uh, William uh, nicely introduced me, I work for Expo 2020. And what I'm going to share with you today is also the approach that I use here at, at Expo 2020, and that is transferable to anywhere. Um, I'm going to be talking about some things that maybe you weren't expecting in this discussion but it all brings a holistic approach to understanding um, strategy for uh, accessibility inclusion for um, passengers with accessible needs. Um, and the beginning of that 
would start with um, the sustainable development goals. So why are this is why am I talking about the sustainable development goals? Well, airports, all, most airports in the world, as part of their member states, all write an annual sustainability report. Either it's on their own or they're using the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI reporting. And they need to address these areas with the sustainable development goals. At the moment, sustainability is not well understood. Most people understand the environmental side of it, but they don't know that there are two other vital components that are involved with those sustainable development goals. And where that particularly involves airports and air travel would be your sustainable cities and communities. So when we look at that, we know that the United Nations has told us that the goal for Sustainable Development Goal 11 is to ensure that cities or organizations, venues, facilities are inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So these safety measures um, at the airport for COVID-19 is dependent on them being inclusive, right? You can't only provide COVID-19 measures for passengers that don't have accessible needs. You do need them for passengers with accessible needs. For example, Social distancing is not done easily. If you have a visual impairment, you may need assistance. Service dogs don't know what social distancing is, okay? Inclusion uh, is dependent on accessibility. So your passengers can't be included in all those experiences at the airport as they take that journey unless they have accessibility. And where does that journey even begin? It was probably the website, which I'll address in a moment. Resilience um, depends on inclusion and accessibility and safety. And together, they collectively create the whole of being a sustainable operation. Uh, and resilience, we're all being tested with this year with COVID-19. How are we coping with, how are we managing, and how are we assuring safety for all passengers, but especially those who are more vulnerable than others? When we look at materiality topics, materiality refers to topics that stakeholders decide are more important than others. And there's a whole list of standards through the Global Reporting Initiative um, on material topics for sustainability reporting. Is your airport engaging internal and external stakeholders to understand where you, where they deem those material topics are, which ones are more important than others. Those will help guide you in understanding how to implement accessible and inclusive measures based on stakeholder needs rather than on a board level um, decision. So sustainability reporting has three impacts, um, has social impact, economic impact, and environmental impact. Most airports are reporting only on environmental impact, noise reduction, emissions to the community, you know, green spacing around the community and whatnot. But what about your social impact? That's also in the sustainable development goals. And if your passengers with accessible needs are not having those needs fully met, then you're not fully meeting those sustainable goals of sustainability reporting. Economic impact is there as well. Do you employ people um, with disabilities? Uh, do you engage with the community organizations of people with disabilities? What opportunities are for them for their voices to be heard on what they need? And those were things that Martin earlier shared with us. It's important that people understand what they're telling you that they need to feel safe, secure, and included. Together, those create what's called the triple bottom line of sustainability reporting. Once an organization has understood what are those material topics, what do we need to focus on, we've engaged with the community, how do we implement this? I cannot emphasize enough, accessibility is far more extensive than most people realize. You must start with engaging a credentialed, experienced accessibility specialist. There are only a few organizations in the world that certify accessibility consultants. 
Gates has now been subsumed under the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. There's the Rick Hansen Foundation in Canada. There's the National Register of Accessibility Consultants in the UK. And the IAP has also taken up the Web Accessibility Specialists. So if you people you are hiring say they're accessibility experts and they don't have a certification from these organizations, then they've not been validated or uh, accredited by any organization. By hiring a credentialed, experienced accessibility consultant will save you time and money. So it impacts your budget in a positive way. Then when you approach, and this is what an accessibility professional would know, is they approach accessibility. It's not a checklist against just standards. It is a holistic understanding. And that holistic perspective comes from what is the passenger's journey? Well, the average passenger journey of getting from point A to point B is relatively seamless. You know, yes, there's occasional things like weather conditions may delay flights. Uh, airplane may go mechanical and have to go down, they need a replacement. But other than those sort of occasional delays, that journey is quite seamless. But for a passenger with accessible needs, they encounter all kinds of barriers all along that journey, right from planning. If your airport, if your uh, airport uh, website or the airlines that fly in out of your airport, their websites are not accessible, that's barrier number one. How does that person navigate their website if they have uh, if they require assistive technology to na navigate digital platforms. What happens when they arrive? What is their transportation journey to, to the website or to the, the airport? Uh, the ticketing agent, the checking in counter, the security, get, the getting to the gate. There are all kinds of barriers that they have to face. Do they have access to duty free, to the shopping, to the, the restaurants? And so approaching this from usually four domains, which is the ecogenic, technogenic, sociogenic, and sensorigenic, I've added in the fifth domain to which you'll understand here includes. The ecogenic is the built environment. That's the basic standards of universal design there. You've got your technogenic domain, which is your digital environment, which is your website, which is apps, which is also digital screens, announcements that come through a digital format. Do they have captioning? Do they have sign language embedded within them? What options do people have to access that that have, that have assistive communication requirements? The sociogenic domain. How well is your staff and your contractors trained on engaging with people with disabilities? How well are they untrained on understanding passengers who might have autism and experience a sensory meltdown at the airport or while in flight? Uh, how well have you engaged with your community um, and understood what their needs are there for full inclusion throughout the entire experience at the airport? The sensorigenic domain um, addresses specifically, particularly those with autism with sensory impairments, but there are other people that have sensory impairments, people with anxiety, people with dementia, and do they? Do you have a safe space in the airport where they can retreat to to uh, mitigate or um, calm their senses because of the anxiety? Many people without any impairments experience anxiety traveling. They're late. Do they forget everything? Do they have everything? Get to the gate. Go through security. But when somebody has added sensory impairments, that experience is at, at, at a very heightened level. So what is on offer at your airport to support these passengers until they safely board on that flight and get on their way? And then lastly, um, added because of the COVID-19 pandemic is what are your COVID uh, protocols to support people with accessible needs? And I know that was a question that came up earlier and I'll try to address that here. So when we look at this, we want to understand what is that passenger with accessible needs journey, okay? I talked about the website. 
Is the airport website accessible? That means does it comply to the web content accessibility guidelines so that anybody who wants information about your website can know and plan that do you have accessible toilets? Do you have a quiet room where someone can go? Do you have um, assistance at the airport for their requirements? Um, all these kinds of factors, can they shop online and it can be delivered? Uh, there's all kinds of information they wanna know. They want reassurance that COVID measures for their needs are in place. On your website, you should also have um, all of this uh, accessibility information so that they know before they ever get to the airport um, what's available for them. That can include things as well as social guides, which I'll get to later on in the journey. We pass through the journey. Many airports have mobile apps, as do airlines. Well, mobile apps, just like websites, have to be rendered accessible. There are at least 10 very specific criteria that make them accessible for people that rely on voice to text or haptic feedback or um, uh, larger print, color contrast, et cetera. Your digital screens for announcements or viewing or when they're just waiting at the gate and the news is on are captions offered there. If you have important announcements that are through video, such as all the videos that came out from from the uh, Delhi uh, airport, which is excellent, are they captioned so that everyone captures that information? Um, your social media channels also need to have captions, sign language, audio description, so that every passenger has full access to this. Uh, I just need to, my screen, the, um, the information about webcam audio and everything is covering this next part, but I know this is transportation. What is that passenger's journey to the airport? Are they arriving by metro, by a city bus, by a taxi, by a private vehicle, uh, getting dropped off? Do they have to park? Do you have accessible parking? What is the journey from the accessible parking to the entry of the airport? Is that whole accessible, is that pathway fully accessible? Are there the dropped curbs? Is the pathway wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair? Are there obstacles in those pathways? Is the drop-off area for private vehicles and taxis, does that have a drop curb and a designated space for uh, people with accessible needs to be let off and easily um, uh, proceed into the terminal? Uh, then we look at once they're inside the terminal, service counters. Do you have lower service counters so that people who are users of wheelchairs can get their check-in process in a, done in a way that's dignified and they're not having to look up above a counter um, in order to do their check-in process? Other service counters for information, for assistance along the way. Are they offering two heights uh, for service counters? It's not just people in wheelchairs, it's people who are also short in stature. The taller counter is also necessary. Maybe somebody needs that support to lean on. When they go through the security screening area, is your security team, which is often um, contractors that are doing it, are they trained for understanding how to engage with people with disabilities, how to engage with those that might need a discrete searching area? Do they have signage so that if I can't hear or communicate or I'm not verbal, I can point to the signs so that you understand my needs? Uh, the discrete searching area, protocols for someone that might have a prosthetic limb. If you're taking that off, what is the most dignified way to manage that and have that person feel respected and, and, and his privacy respected along the way? Uh, do you offer the sunflower lanyard uh, that for hidden impairments so that someone can wear that through the airport and that you, airport staff is aware that this person has additional needs, a hidden impairment of some kind? Maybe they're deaf. If they're sitting at the gate waiting, an announcement comes that the gate has changed and they're sitting there and they haven't heard it, they're not going to move to the other gate. But if your staff see that sunflower lanyard there, that's an indication that perhaps we should go to this person to inform more directly rather than 
relying on an announcement. Multi-faith rooms, are they accessible? Can everyone uh, enter these? Is there appropriate space for them? Your smoking rooms, can those accommodate smokers who use wheelchairs uh, or have other mobility impairments or other needs to go in there? Um, what about Jennifer, your staff training? Yes. Jennifer, sorry. Uh, uh, as you know, we are, we are very uh like clockworks on timing your presentation okay. is fantastic and also i Thank believe you. william has a question for, for you from from the floor yeah one of the okay. what uh, they're they're uh please keep the questions coming and we will answer those uh we'll send them to the presenters afterward as well uh that we can answer but one of the questions that came up jennifer was um looking at airport standard operating procedures um and emergency plans that consider specific aspects uh, for passengers with reduced mobility in the holistic approach slide that you showed, um, in which bubble do we need to consider and include uh, those plans? Those plans are, are usually under uh, policies and procedures with the organization. And again, the airport, I know that there are often, often at airports, they have various contractors, right? They have a contractor for security. They might have a contractor for uh, baggage assistance and whatnot, but they should have protocols in place that if passengers have mobility impairments, what's the evacuation procedure and what are the um, facilities that we have in place to support that? I mean, all, the first would be a fire safe uh, lift right, that can accommodate them, and who are the designated fire wardens that are being trained um, how to support people with that, or if absolutely necessary, they need to use an evacuation chair, people are trained on how to do that and, and support someone in the event of an emergency evacuation. Fantastic. Roberto? Thank you very much, Jennifer. You're, it was a fantastic presentation, and I hope you would be able to make it available for everybody on the Slack um, uh, forum uh, to for for the web because it uh, I understand that the, there's there's other questions coming. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so it was a pleasure right. to see you today, and we now have to Thank move you. on to the next speaker. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. Now it is always an honor for me to introduce Linda Ristagno. Linda is the Assistant Director External Affairs at the International Air Transport Association. She is committed to advocating human rights for business and proudly leads the Accessibility Aviation Program in IATA. I have to say, if I may add something to, to your superb resume, that Linda is has the uh, unique ability of bringing the human aspect into policy because normally policy is a little bit distant and cold but linda has this this true amazing uh, uh, gift of bringing humanity into into policy so the floor is yours linda thank you thank you Robert, and thank you to everyone i'm not sure if you are able to see my screen i don't see myself uh do you see my screen? I don't. Let me see if I'm able to share it. Yeah, it you should have a you should have a uh, a little sign yes, that comes up. Yes, I share do. Screen. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. I want to do. Okay. Do you see now the presentation? Right. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Voila. Okay. Let me see. Oh. Okay, no one can see your screen. Okay, very good. <laughs> sure well, screen. We <laughs> voila, now you should see Great. it. There, perfect. Very perfect. And then uh, just, yeah, hit the, uh, hit the play and you're good. Okay, so let me see. I have used in the past this system, but unbelievably, I I don't I'm still not able to use it. <laughs> it's the dark side of information technology. <laughs> uh, it is, huh? It is. There you are. You see got me, it. You Perfect. can see my screen. You can see yes. everything. So. <laughs> All right. See you in a little bit. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone, and um, uh, as usual, it gives me immense pleasure to be in this um, uh, to be in this event. 
and share a few uh, updates on the accessibility field uh, with us. Thank you so much, Roberto, for your introduction. But I think we are all human beings. That's why we bring our perspective to, to, to the business. Um, so let me first say uh, why this is important for IATA. As you, as many of you know, IATA has started this um, uh, the accessibility journey officially in 2018 when I joined this um, this position. And uh, for us, this is very important. And this year, um, during the accessibility symposium, we have reiterated our commitment to, to safe and sustainable uh, air travel for all. Um, of course, the COVID pandemic um, uh, has had um, challenges for, for uh, has brought many challenges for the aviation industry, as for many, many people, countries and, um, and sectors. But we have taken this um, uh, challenge as an opportunity when it comes to accessibility and to build back better. Because we think that every person has the right to safe, reliable and uh, dignified uh, dignified travels. Um, of course, we, uh, there are still uh, some issues, especially when it comes to um, accessibility regimes uh, in uh, different parts of the world, because um, you may be aware that um, uh, different uh, legislation and uh, um, uh, different regulations don't really um, talk each other. And this is something that we are uh, taking very seriously as, as well to try to put together regulators to speak to, to speak the same language and to have coordinated policy. Uh, some good successes out there this year, um, uh, thanks to some coalitions that the aviation industry was able to, to have. I'm sure you are all aware about the new um, uh, policy making on uh, emotional support animals uh, that actually, I think it will be published today uh, officially in the government section of the United States. That finally, this policy uh, making is um, uh, allowing um, and actually is not allowing any more emotional support animals to be uh, transported on on an air on aircrafts in the United States. And this is something that we had try, uh, tried to uh, assess since, since a long time, since 2016 at least. And this is just one of the examples where policy and regulations don't really talk each other. And IATA is acting like the middle, um, like a mediator for regulators to enhance uh, um, more coordinated uh, uh, regula uh, regulations. Um, it's not only the, the reason, we think as well that providing good service um, uh, to the market uh, uh, makes business sense. It makes business sense because we have discovered that not, I mean, that still um, due to the um, uh, constraints uh, that were uh, very uh, well uh, uh, shown by the by the Dr. Jennifer Canulli, um, Camulli, uh, not too many people are um, still able to to have a seamless travel, not too many passengers with disabilities. So this means that there are not too many people able to uh, travel on an aircraft and we want to assess that because it, it of course, uh, it's a human rights issue, but it makes um, uh, business sense. But mostly if we get this right, everybody will, uh, will, uh, will benefit. So where we are here, um, as you know, last year in 2019 was um, uh, the, the time when we finally uh, were able to get out um, a resolution. Um, and I, the IATA resolution means the commitment from uh, the airline industry to um, improve the air travel experience for people living with disabilities. Uh, uh, worldwide. So this was unanimously uh, approved by uh, more than 200, uh, 280 airlines in the world. Um, and um, uh, we made this commitment through a set of uh, um, um, of um, 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 
that there were some um, specific statements that were made by, by the industry. This year was supposed to be the year of heating and going really, really strong with, uh, with um, uh, accessibility. Of course, we have been a bit stopped by the, um, uh, by the COVID-19, but not too much because um, um, you may not be aware, but the, the, there is a lot of policy making in, the, in many parts of the world, included uh, the Canadians, uh, uh, included the Europeans and the United States in many different instances. But mostly, one of the things that we, we were able to do with the Accessibility Working Group and with the cooperation of uh, uh, Roberto and the Open Doors for Disability, we released the guidance on accessible air travel in response to COVID-19. This guidance was released because we realized that the DIK or, um, manuals were not really assessing what, which were the needs for or passengers with disabilities traveling by air in time of COVID. And and in, especially in time of pandemic. So we thought that it would have made sense that it, this would come from uh, um, uh, the aviation industry in coordination with, uh, with, the, disability, with the disability community. Um, this will help us to build back better because uh, um, uh, the, the different uh, uh, statements and the different, uh, or, um, um, the different actions that we will be having, we will be having with, uh, with state regulators will help us to build better for 2021 for the different um, uh, initiatives that we have ongoing. I'm showing here in this slide some recent initiatives. Um, this year, again, uh, we were able to run uh, online uh, the IATA Global Accessibility Symposium. This is a big event that started uh, that started in uh, 2019. Uh, in 2019, and the first time was held in um, in uh, in uh, Dubai. Um, we wanted to have this symposium. Uh, here in Geneva this year, of course, it was not possible to the COVID. But I have to say that I was very pleased because the symposium uh, we got very good um, outcomes out of, of uh, out of the symposium. First of all, we, we got the commitment from the top management that we are taking this um, uh, the accessibility uh, topic very seriously, and uh, then uh, we also managed to get some outcomes uh, in preparation of 2000. 2021. For example, I wanted to share with you that in 2021 we will uh, uh, work on policy and procedures related to uh, passengers with the hidden disabilities that represent the 70% of the global population who has um, who has uh, who is disabled. Uh, another big initiative that we had this year, uh, thinking to um, innovation, was the IATA uh, Air Hackathon. This was uh, held in uh, Seattle before the pandemic, uh, just right before the, the world was closing down. And the reason why we had this IATA hackathon was to create some um, uh, innovation uh, around um, uh, the accessibility topic and specifically on the loading of mobility aids. I was listening to Martin before and he was mentioning that it's still uh, uh, difficult for, um, uh, for him to uh, the, the, the safe loading, safe and secure loading of his mobility aid. This is something that we are addressing from different perspectives as well. It is a big topic for us. We are addressing from a policy perspective with some form of political commitment again from our members. And um, uh, I hope I will be able to share more on this topic uh, um, very, very soon. But also we are looking at, at the safe loading of mobility aids from an, um, an, an innovative way, uh, like um, uh, to being able to track and trace uh, uh, the, um, uh, the mobility aid, so the passengers uh, are know, uh, first of all, if the aid has been loaded on board of the aircraft, uh, in the cargo hold, and second, uh, um, they will be able to track the mobility aid and to see, uh, I mean, uh, and to give them the the, the peace of heart that, that, that they are traveling um, with their with their aids as well. 
This um, another thing that I wanted to share. Um, we are working together with uh, with the ACI on uh, um, on some initiatives to deliver a more accessible and inclusive journey for journey for all. Uh, this will um, we will have more initiatives coming um, in uh, in uh, 2000 in 2021. Uh, I think I haven't gotten anything big. Um, again, for 2021, a big, a big topic will be the, the policy and the coordination with the three main regulators. Uh, the first one will be the, the United States regulators with whom we, we have initiated some new uh, initiatives following their recommendations. So you will see more coming from a uh, um, standardization perspective, but, uh, but also alignment uh, um, around the use of the special uh, service code. When it comes uh, to the special service code, I know that it's a very hot topic. So um, there will be some initiatives specific to the education of uh, not only the passengers, but also education related to um, uh, other, other users, like, for example, the travel agents uh, um, as uh, the travel agents as well. Uh, we will work again uh, with uh, the Canadian Transportation Agency on some research um, uh, specific to, to the use of the SSR codes uh, um, again and some other uh, big initiatives trying to put together on the same page the disability community, the, uh, the state regulators and also the, um, uh, the air travel industry. With air travel industry um, I include of course also airports and, um, and other stakeholders uh, um, involved in the, in the supply chain. Um, Big activity is also about on uh, communication. Um, um, you will see that next year there will be the accessibility symposium will be a big. Uh, there will be a big surprise uh, that we will be able to communicate very very soon. But we are thinking to an overall uh, um, coordination um, in relation to the passenger uh, journey um, and where accessibility will be um, uh, will be uh, touched on um, on different on different uh, perspectives. Um, finally, done. Yeah. Yes, you're, uh, we 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 ran out of time. We do have um, we do have a number of questions. Uh, we're going to be going to the break yes. after this, so I think we could take um, we could at least take one, Roberto. Yes, um, there is a question I'm from sorry, the Sorry, I don't see the yeah. And yeah, don't, they, they're don't. asking, will Ayata come up with a policy to provide a separate separate security check for disability community at airports? It is so already is, is Ayata supporting uh, dedicated uh, security lanes. Uh, this is something that has to be looked at with um, uh, with the airports because it's very specific to uh, to airport security. But what I can tell you is uh, uh, some work has already been uh, uh, conducted uh, uh, beginning of 2020 with uh, uh, with the ICAO, uh, with the security section of the ICAO, and we have addressed some of the uh, issues related to the dignified uh, uh, security check for passengers with disabilities. It is nothing that we can share publicly because, as you know, when it comes to aviation security, most of those information are um, restricted. Yeah. You should see the changes already. Um, in uh, Then it's up to the airports and to, to the airlines now, to, uh, first of all, to the state regulators, because those recommendations that are in the Aviation Security Manual are very specific to the state regulators that then they should cascade to uh, the, um, the airlines and the airports. But you should see something already coming. I think that the, the guidance has, uh, has been released already. Fantastic, but, Linda. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. Having been involved uh, in some of the projects you mentioned, I know that uh, the future looks much brighter than, than the past. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank William, you, Linda, very pleasure. much. Um, everyone, we have come to the break in the afternoon. We'll, re we'll uh, start up again at 3.30. Um, right now, I would like to introduce to you um, a fellow who I spoke with, and he said it was great if we would use this footage of him uh, uh, performing 
in John Wayne International Airport um, as part of a music in airports uh, endeavor. So please enjoy and be back at 3.30. Thank you very much. And we are back with the second session of today's conference. I have now the immense pleasure to introduce to you um, William Neese, who will be our next speaker. William is the director of airport solutions at Ausian Airport Software and brings a culmination of more than 20 years of executive leadership and client-based success to every interaction. He founded and helped de develop the business model for one of the first sustainable real estate companies in the US, Green Key Real Estate in the San Francisco Bay Area. As a conference and sales director, William led government, business, and education technology conferences. I have to say that William is the heart and soul uh, of a great team. And because William is a, a master team player and he manages to bring along everybody and take the best out of everybody. So the floor is yours, William. Thank you very much. Great. I hope that everyone can see me and they can also see my screen. Would that be, would we say okay to that, Roberto? Absolutely. Everyone, okay, great. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the, the musical break. And um, I, I wanted to sort of bring together uh, not just the Ozone view, but really the view moving that, that, that we embrace with uh, various clients, various airports, and uh, the, the, where we see uh, everyone fitting in and where we're, where we're going as far as the actual service for our passengers uh, with reduced mobility. So everything I'll show you today is, is currently available, but I think for a number of areas in the world, this should help to uh, bring about uh, sort of a, a thought process of change. Um, as we all know, COVID has been uh, an experience that has uh, been extremely negative. Um, and uh, on the other hand, it has given us an opportunity to sort of look at this service uh, in a different light that we frankly haven't had in the last 10 years. Um, a quick overview of Ozeon, I'm not gonna go into every, every uh, little bit, um, but you know, the, I think the, the thing that's important about us is that we are uh, airport based um, and uh, we work with our clients um, and passengers, et cetera, to continually get the service uh, right and improve. Um, we, again, being airports being a, a core, uh, core area for us and the PRM manager being the flagship solution. Here is an overview of where we're currently installed. Um, though 2020, again, has been a, a, a very, uh, fractious year. Uh, we have seen that uh, during this last year, we've actually installed uh, the solution in seven uh, airports. And a lot of that has to do with, again, this idea of how do we begin to take uh, uh, solutions, systems, operations that have been in place for many years and bring about change that just wasn't uh, possible before. So uh, the core uh, for all of us, I think, uh, in, this, in, in, in this group with us today is uh, really how do we best serve our passengers and how do we best serve our airlines, our airports, and our assisted operations. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I think that it's important to take into account that we're all part of it and then also put the passenger at the, uh, the center. So. I'm gonna go through a few of those different areas, start with assisted service operations and um, sort of, you know, what are some keys for success for really getting uh, that right? So uh, a, couple, a couple of them are to have all of the information entered directly into the systems that are operating your services. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's from CETA, from Air Inc., if it's from the airlines directly, if it's coming in from uh, the train station, car rental companies, wherever it is, you want those orders to come uh, into, the, into your system directly. Um, also, what we're, what we're experiencing and what we're seeing is this real 
push towards um, being able to understand not just what's happening today, but what's going to be happening uh, coming into the near future. So uh, forecasting is important. Um, live dispatching, having having a view of your service level agreements where you as the operator understand how you're doing right now so that when you answer that question at the end of the week or the end of the month, then you're able to answer it with confidence that you have the correct answer because you've been navigating and uh, performing the service that um, uh, th at the level that you want to. And again, then having all of that historically stored so you can then go back and compare how did we do versus our resourcing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then of course, uh, the all important, the ability to go in and manage delays, uh, if there's any challenges with a, a particular uh, passenger, that sort of thing, to go in immediately and say, okay, what happened? And how do we then correct that now, not later, but correct it now and, and move on? Um, I, I think that the, the, the live operation management um, is also key for the operations, being able to, uh, on the far left, you'll see sort of a, a view of your, your tasks coming up for the day versus your resource available. Are we okay? Can we take that and, and, and look at it in the live environment so that when something does occur, if we start seeing that shift, then we immediately know, hey, wait a minute, we've got an issue. We need to start making adjustments uh, as we go forward. And again, at this point, uh, there are some airports that we can go out about 14 days uh, on that view. And then having the complete passenger overview and um, having what we call heat maps, uh, uh, delay indicators for every single passenger. It doesn't matter if you're a very small airport with 100 passengers a day, or you're a very large airport with 5,000 passengers a day, you still want to be able to manage each and every passenger journey. And that then goes into that view of saying, okay, well, if we have this many passengers, if we go in and we immediately look inside and say, okay, where is each of our passengers and where are uh, where is the service currently? It doesn't matter really if we're using beacons or if we're using wayfinding. Um, the, the idea is to bring in as much referential material as possible um, and then be able to understand not where agents are. Having a map with agents all over the place, that's one thing. But knowing where an agent is and where that agent is going to end up, uh, that will, will uh, lead to uh, amazing uh, advancements. Um, and again, then dynamic reporting. Bring BI tools into your environment so that you can, within the system, use the data and actually start to uh, start to affect change. A few examples um, that uh, that can be used during the service again, live or after the service, um, in a dynamic way, is to to be able to go in and look at, let's say, how many passengers have we actually seen in our airport? Um, what are uh, the types of passengers that are going through our airports? Um, can, we, can we understand our SLAs in a way that uh, we can uh, improve again? Um, also, then the airline notifications. So the ecosystem, where, where we are right now is we're looking at the airlines, the passenger, the airport, the assistive operations, all of them working together. So that when we're when we're talking about the SLA for the airline, we're also talking about the SLA that the airline is offering for their notification and uh, going forward. And lastly, um, uh, we we do a lot with custom reports. One custom report that um, I think could change uh, in any airport. It could lead to a savings of three to five percent immediately. And, and really improve efficiency is this idea of the no-shows on arrival. Um, and what we're doing there is we're really looking at where, where are they coming from? What airlines are they on? Where is the, the aircraft? Um, and if you think about that, and you think about the impact that has on your operation when you're sending 10 to 15% of your staff to a passenger that simply isn't there, uh, it, can be, it can be huge. Um, I'm checking the time because I know that I go too fast, uh, too long all the time. Um, <laughs> don't come anywhere near me, Roberto. Um, then airlines, how, does it, how, do we, how are we seeing airlines involved in all of this? And what we're doing is we're seeing that 
airlines are 100% operational inside the system. So they can check their passengers, they can see who's coming uh, to their gate. And in addition, they can see things like ad hoc passengers with mobility devices that are coming uh, that may cause uh, some disruption if they don't know that that passenger is coming. Uh, that then leads into live, um, live dashboards for the uh, uh, airlines, which again, if, if the airline is giving information, the operation is creating uh, the data, then what we want to do is we want to bring everybody back into this. So how can we do this with the airline? We give them a, a view of, of how are they performing. How are they performing with their notifications? And how are they performing with their uh, the service operation? How many passengers is my airline uh, seeing today? And um, who are we serving? Uh, if you look at the, the bottom right, you have the current SSR distribution. That's, that is using the IATA Type B messaging to determine who are we seeing inside of uh, uh, our operation. And then we can quickly jump again, because we have all of the data inside the system and we're starting with good data, then we can start looking at the bigger picture. So here uh, for an airline, we can go in and we can say, okay, how's the airline notification? How's the overall traffic uh, during the year for that airline? And where do we see the ups and the downs occurring? And if you take that, uh, you know, moving from the airline to the airport uh, now, what you can do is you could also take that for the airport. So you could say, okay, here, we're looking at a specific airline. Let's look at all the airlines inside of our ecosystem and how is everyone performing? Um, you start then thinking about, well, if, if we're performing at a certain rate on the notifications at a certain time of the year, then how are we doing on the no-shows? It really, it really starts getting, getting interesting uh, when, you, when you start looking at the data together. Um, and all of this can, uh, can really have an impact whether, again, whether you're in Europe, or you're in the United States or anywhere uh, really in the world, the, the idea of this data sharing, this data collaboration, is that we are securing the passengers and in the airports uh, area, we're giving them the best possible set of information so that they can, uh, one, regulate the airport, but two, plan for the future, such as development plans. Um, so the airports can also drill down, they can also go into this sort of deeper look. They can see how uh, uh, agents are traveling throughout the, the airport, where a passenger is. If we run into a, a disaster recovery situation, where are all of my passengers that we're currently serving under our roof? Immediately, we can, we can put out a call to all the agents and, um, and regulate that, uh, which is, I think, um, very important. And again, right down to the gate. So the, the concept really is for the assisted uh, service operations, uh, everything that we just went through, now let's take that out and spread it out. So you can, if you're, if you're operating the service, you can work in multiple airport operations within the system. You can centralize your dispatching. You can bring in many small airports and dispatch them all remotely. Um, you can scale and you can go into a complex hub and have that all in one environment with multiple airlines or um, the entire airport, if you will. Uh, for airports, it's really key to begin to understand what's our volume? What are our key statistics? Um, who are we serving inside of our airport? And then identify the bottlenecks. Where are we having challenges uh, inside of our, our airport? Share live operational data. When, we, when, when we're all looking at what we get from airports, we get the, the AODB, and why not give back to the airport? So the, oper so the airport has data that is being created through the service and then shares that across all of their operators. Um, again, ensure readiness and security, uh, improve airport performance, and again, have a multi-provider view of a single airport or multiple airports. And then this then brings us uh, around to the airlines themselves. Um, have, again, have that live view of the passenger journey manage complex hubs, multiple complex hubs. Uh, so every place that that airline has a hub, put them all under the same system and you can track your, your passengers across the network. Manage transfers, uh, reporting, 
and live data sharing. Again, the live data sharing uh, at this point, in my opinion, is in many ways uh, more critical to reaching the SLA than just providing data post, uh, post the event. Um, so with that, uh, you know, standardizing the passenger experience, again, that would be a, a key for the airlines. And in the end, if we, if we take all of this um, and, we, and, and, and we come back, what are we doing? We're making sure that passengers get, an off, get on and off an aircraft, but we're also making sure that they have the best possible experience. And I think that we all agree that that is what we're, we're striving to do. Thank you very much. And with that, I will hand it over to Roberto. Thank you very much, William. I have to admire that for once you have been perfectly on time. This has been great. I think it's the first time ever. <laughs> Anyways, it, it, you know, it always amazes me the way you manage to uh, translate very complex, uh, very technical uh, schemes into something that humans can understand. Uh, I, I was following your presentation and, and I could actually understand uh, what you were saying, but also the benefits that it brings. Uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, IT is the foundation of, of, of the old assistant services. And when you have the right IT in place, you can manage and interact with all stakeholders so that everybody as one can, can get together. Um, I think we have a question. Uh, sorry. Uh, there has been a question from the floor. Uh, okay, most of the passengers have found to miss their flights as they do not report to the gate on time. This is mostly because most of airports have gone silent, uh, have got silent announcement zones. Do airports propose to set up a system whereby they can send voice message on their mobile phone or alert them that boarding is on? I think this is more of a general uh, question, but more into the interaction between the, all, all the systems available in the airport. And, and I, think that's, I think that's actually a very important uh, piece to it because it goes back to the idea of uh, the sharing of data. So, um, you know, one of the SSR codes that are part of the messaging is DEF. Um, and so a passenger can and can and should be able to self-mobilize throughout the airport and then have the airport ecosystem supporting the passenger. Um, so one way to do that would be to, and you can track it with inside of a system, hand them something that they can take with them and then drop off at the gate or have everybody notified um, at the gate again in advance that this particular passenger is there and, and may require additional assistance. I have two further questions and then the next ones will be answered after the conference. One is very short and, and direct. Is the forecasting based on historical data and flight schedules or purely on pre-booked uh, CETA requests? Um, what we do is we're combining the, you have the forecasting with the, the messages that you have coming in, and then you're looking at the, your, your historical view of do we get 30% um, you know, what, what is the, the additional ad hoc rate uh, that we get into, into the airport? This is getting very technical, the, the second question. Uh, are there products or tools already in place that help with the concept or we are still relying on type B PSM to advise airports and downstream colleagues? Um, currently, the, uh, the, the PAL-CAL PSM, and we're going to Tomorrow, we're going to have a deep dive into this particular subject because I think that it is um, a, an area that we can really delve into and, one, get everyone to agree that we are using that system. Um, when you're using the PAL system and the CAL system and the PSMs, you can really effectively manage uh, your, your operations. So um, I know that there are movement messages in different areas that, that people want to go. But as a baseline, if we stick with the IATA type B messaging, I think that gives us a platform to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you again, William. And the floor is yours for the next presentation. Great. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you for sticking with us uh, after the break and into the afternoon. Um, next, we have Laurel Van Horn. Uh, she is the Director of Programs with Open Doors Organization. 
And much of Laurel's work at Open Doors organization is in the field of aviation, including development and delivery of training programs and symposia for airports, airlines, and airline service companies. For ACI Global Training, she conducts a popular three-day workshop entitled Accommodating Passengers with Disabilities. Laurel was the lead investigator for the ACRP Report 210, Innovative Solutions to Facilitate Accessibility for Airport Travelers with Disabilities. It is my absolute pleasure, Laurel, and thank you for getting up so early to, uh, to uh, welcome you to the event this year. Okay, thank you, William. Um, I've got to figure out how to get back to so I can see my slides now. Uh, how do I do that? Oh. We can see your slides. Yeah, I need to see them though. That's my issue. Uh, if you didn't have any problem when we did this yesterday. Right. If you press the play button, do they come up for you? Uh, yeah, there, there you go. go. All right, there, there we go. go. All right, thanks. All right. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks, William, for having me again. It's great. Oh, now I'm back and don't have my my screen again. Um, hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, frustrating. Um, so the topic is not as advertised. It's actually. Um, I'm going to be talking about measuring customer satisfaction, or if actually, in fact, ensuring customer satisfaction today. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to be back at this great event again. I'm sorry I'm not in Paris, but um, now we have a window on the world instead, so which is wonderful. Um, so this is new research from the Airport Cooperative Research Program in the U.S. Uh, the, the lead on it is EOS Partners this time with Open Doors and Butterfly Consulting as the subject matter experts. Um, and it's a follow-up to our earlier research, um, Report 210 and 177, which are available from the ACRP website. Uh, one was on innovative solutions, and we were the lead on that. The other was how to enhance your airport wayfinding for customers with disabilities. So now we're looking at how do we actually test what we're creating. Um, and we just finished primary research you know, with interviews and focus groups with um, aviation stakeholders from the US, Canada, and Europe. We also interviewed the UK Civil Aviation Authority. So the guidebook we're creating for this um, is going to include research tools for use by airports um, and uh, also by other entities like airlines um, and service companies. So this research is going on for another year. So if you have something you'd like to share, something you're doing that's innovating, we would love to hear from you. Open Doors does its own market study. We just finished one. The Harris Bowl conducted it in June and July. And what we wanted to look at was the boom period before COVID. So it's 2018 and 19. Um, and once again, we found that 70% of adults with disabilities are actually traveling on this. Um, that's the same as in earlier studies. Uh, but what we found is that they're actually traveling more frequently. Um, they're spending more. So there was a huge jump in spending from 34.6 billion um, up to 58.7 billion. And there's actually a multiplier effect that you can also um, look at because people don't travel alone. They usually travel with one or two other adults. So, uh, so it's actually um, a much bigger market than it actually looks like. And then we found that the numbers were way up for air travel as well. We're up to 11 billion um, uh, for the period 2018-19. Um, and then, unfortunately, people are still encountering major obstacles in their air travel. So 76% are still having problems with airlines, 70% with airports. And these figures had actually increased from the previous study in, in 2015. Uh, so how can we resolve some of these issues? We look at what are we measuring in terms of customer service for customers with disabilities? How satisfied are they? Well, in general, the status quo is that we're not actually measuring this. ASQ, Skytrax, and JD Power look at customer satisfaction overall, but not really for customers with disabilities. I believe Skytrax has one or two questions now. They do an award for that, but it's pretty minimal. In Europe, uh, the focus has been on efficiency, um, the wait times, um, you know, since there are standards for that. In the US, we don't even have those standards. Um, or in Canada. We have a 30-minute rule, 
It says you cannot leave people unattended um, for more than 30 minutes without checking on them. But in terms of SLAs or KPIs, we don't really have anything like that. Um, the airlines would, of course, be developing their own. Um, so how do we move away from simply handling people as if they were packages mm -hmm. actually serving them? Um, which is one of the express goals of the IATA accessibility. So IATA actually, in their 2019 Global Travel Survey, broke out the figures for satisfaction by satisfaction are. Um, so right from booking through to bag collection in the slide, we can see that the passengers with disabilities were less satisfied right across the board. So clearly this is something that we, we all uh, together have to work on. So to satisfy customers, yeah, first we have to understand them. Um, these are not homogenous groups. Even within the type of disability or severity of disability, um, yeah, these people have many other characteristics. So one of the things we do for all our other passengers is we, we do segmentation studies. So, you know, some of the initial segmentation factors that we can look at for travelers with disabilities or older adults include, you know, are they traveling independently or are they being assisted? I know in this conference we're focusing pretty much on the latter, but I think it's, it's, it serves all of us if we can help enhance independence. Um, and certainly during COVID, we can see why people would want to be more independent. Um, so are they traveling alone? Are they with someone else? What's the purpose of the travel? You know, are they an experienced traveler? Or are they somebody that's going to need a lot more service and, and support as they go through the different processes at the airport? Are they using mobile devices? Um, in general, yes, our study shows that, that people are traveling, um, a great majority are traveling with a, a, a smartphone or a tablet. Um, this drops off, of course, after age 75, but um, in general, um, we need to know this as well. So how can we reach them if we need to get in touch with them, for example? Um, and then um, some people are higher income. They may want a personalized concierge service instead of, of an, a regular assistance service. So on this slide, what I'm showing is a methodology that was developed um, um, and shown in a, in a report from ACI Europe called Guidelines for Passenger Services at European Airports. As the slide is from um, a presentation by TH Airport Consulting um, that, that happened in, in 2015. But it sums up very neatly this methodology. <clears throat> so first, who are your passengers? And that's the kind of segmentation um, uh, exercise that I was just talking about. It's very multidimensional. And then once we know that, then what are their needs and expectations? Uh, and then how can we enhance the passenger experience to meet those, those needs and expectations? The pyramid there is for per passenger perceptions. So what is required? Um, and that's the basic services. Uh, what is expected? You know, what are the, new, the other things that, that can make their experience um, at least a good one? And then what's valued? What is the wow factor for these, for these passengers? And then this slide just shows um, for the premises part of the trip, um, you know, what can we do for older adults? So their expectations um, and needs are to have shorter walking distances, good wayfinding, and then seats throughout all the different parts of the terminal. And then from that, we can look at, you know, how are we moving people between levels? You know, do we have automated doors? What is our signage like? Um, and then how do we assist for the longer distances? Do we have people movers? Do we have something like a an electric um, car um, transit system, for example. So in our research now, we've identified some, some best practices for customer service and assessment. Clearly one thing that we need to do is make accessibility part of our customer service mission. Um, typically in the US at least, we treat this separately as a compliance issue. So a lot of us are still looking at customers with disabilities as being a problem rather than being a marketing opportunity. And that's something obviously we need. That shift has already happened at the leading airports that, that we interviewed for the project. Um, we need community input. I know a lot of other speakers today have already talked about that. Um, if we build something right from the beginning with that kind of input, then when we measure it, we're gonna find the kind of satisfaction levels that we want. Um, we need to include our SLAs in all contracts. 
this is sort of uh, obvious, but in, in, in the states, we often don't even have any baseline standards. So these standards can exceed regulatory minimums, of course, but we need to have them in place. And then we can always benchmark. It's great to see what everybody else in the world is doing. And then the measurement tools are really going to vary from airport to airport, but you know there are all kinds of tools which which can be brought to to bear on the issue. And they're the same ones basically that we use for customer service in general. But then we need to figure out how to adapt them to meet to to meet um, you know what we're doing with these particular groups of passengers. So I'm going to talk now about some various case studies. I may run out of time, but these slides will be available after the fact. So the first one is Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And they, major th they <clears throat> oversee three major airports, Newark, LaGuardia, and JFK. So they recently did a, a research exercise that is really paying off for them. They uh, did journey mapping with people with a variety of disabilities. Um, and that led them to create new standards for airport design and also for customer care. So one thing they found out was the spaces are too small for the larger um, devices and motorized devices that people are now using. So in new construction, they're increasing their wheelchair space and their turning radius. Um, this is really important, obviously. They also saw that they're not meeting certain needs. So now they're going to be putting in adult changing tables in their companion restrooms. They're going to be putting in hearing loops in the terminals. Um, and then the next step in the process is they've now gone out to all their terminal operators who are the airlines and they're telling them, look, now we want a service excellence action plan from you that touches, you know, that addresses each touch point, each disability type with two different typologies, as they call them, requires assistance and self-assisted. Um, and for each of these, they want KPIs and SLAs um, to be determined in collaboration with their other stakeholders. Um, so this is, this is really going to be um, an amazing exercise and one that we're going to look forward to. Are my out of time already? Now Unfortunately, I yes, I know we are, we are running a very tight schedule and, and a tight ship, I have to say. I see William is hiding in the, oh, there he is. <laughs> and my slides have now gone away anyway. So let me just say that I was also going to talk about um, the Canadian airports and Dublin and Hermes airports at, at London Heathrow. All these airports are now reaching out, sitting down with the customers, running them through the terminals and and saying, look, how can we make things better for you? And and then they're 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 actually testing what they're creating after the fact. So um, it's it's an ongoing exercise, but one that we're delighted to see is well underway in some of the leading airports around the world. Um, and thanks so much, William, for this opportunity. And uh, again, if anybody has input they want to give to the research, we would we would love to have it. Um, Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much, William. Do you have? Well, I, I, I just with... wanted to I just wanted to throw in there that um, the work that Open Doors does is absolutely incredible. Um, we will uh, be sharing uh, both uh, the slides and links back to Laurel and Open Doors. Um, and uh, please, Laurel, continue doing the, the great work that you guys are doing. Thank you, William. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. And it's, so it's now my gra greatest pleasure to introduce to you a, I don't know where to start, a leader, an innovator, a strategist, a speaker, a formidable speaker for sure, but also a great leader and, and, and the best innovator in the industry. Uh, is uh, Brian Cobb is Chief Innovation Officer at Cincinnati Northern, Northern Kentucky International Airport since January 2018. He's done so many things. I don't want to waste time. I just want to watch your presentation because I know it will be fantastic. The floor is yours, Brian. So always good to have an intro by the great Roberto Castiglione. William, thank you so much as always for the invite. And it's killing me that we're not in Paris. So please, somebody, we'll, we'll figure out this vaccine soon enough and get it uh, get it globally. Next Roberto, year. Thanks Next again year. very much. Uh, I'm going to call my publicist list as well. You probably saw my face pop up during Laurel's presentation. Laurel, I'm terribly sorry. I do not want to have to follow you in the future. <laughs> Fantastic comments as always and uh, tremendously spot on for that uh, information. 
All right. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides. Let's uh, let's get underway. Brian Cobb, Chief Innovation Officer for the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. Uh, Roberto's comments um, would suggest perhaps that we do unique things, and absolutely, uh, to, before we do that, CBG is located in the Midwest of the uh, United States. We're about 500 nautical miles to the west of Washington, D.C., for those of you familiar with uh, Washington and New York City. So we are uh, really in a quiet place in the country. Uh, we are a mid-size international airport, but all of the accoutrements of a massive, large uh, airport operator. As you can see by this slide, of keen interest is not only the passenger side, and I know today is, is certainly focused on the PRM elements, um, but critical that we understand it at CBG, we have two massive global cargo carriers, DHL obviously, and Amazon Prime Air. Amazon has chosen CBG as its first global air hub, and we very much are partnering, partnering with Amazon and DHL for future strategic growth and certainly community support. I will have no doubt that they will join us in really this provoking thought leadership and personalization going forward. And really in short, from the strategic approach from CBG, it was all about establishing the brand, building the brand, and then ultimately future-proofing is where we're just on the cusp as we get into 2021. And notice that last word, nurturing. It's very much about recognizing how to exude a nurturing feeling for our customer, regardless of their ability. And in order to do that, uh, our innovation strategy is focused on four verticals. It's transport connect, clean and secure. Of course, today we're gonna focus on two of those uh, related to PRM directly, which is transport and connect. When it comes to transport, notice the word personal and autonomous. We very much are focused on those elements and those elements lead immediately to a curated experience. And of course, that last section, accurate, meaningful, empowering. We want to make sure that our consumer feels as if they have all of the necessary data to make sure that their entire journey is seamless as possible and very enjoyable. So that's something that we've uh, kind of lost sense of along the way. And then ultimately our structure on the innovation front is very much an entrepreneurial spirit. So I'm fortunate to be surrounded by some tremendous minds that are all working collaboratively together to produce some very unique things. Before the unique element, it's the basics. So we very strategically work with our TSA. We're fortunate in the relationship that we have locally. And we went so far as to, uh, similar to other airports, but perhaps we went a little bit further, where we ensure that every lane set is wheelchair accessible. It seems so basic, but unfortunately with our 11 lanes, only two of those were wheelchair accessible just five years ago. We really restructured and, and went into a significant construction project really to make sure that that happened. And it worked exceptionally well, and we're very proud of that. And then some of you might remember that we were the first airport in the US to really launch Will, if you're familiar with this device. Um, just almost on the cusp as well as an autonomous vehicle, we envisioned Will becoming an autonomous vehicle. Um, you're looking at the early stage unit that has since been, the design has since changed. And we are uh, incredibly fortunate to still have that relationship with the Will and Scoot Around team today. Uh, we anticipate that we'll get back into this market, um, hopefully within the next year, year and a half or so. But since then, Will has uh, been broadcast around the world and they're doing exceptionally well in major airports. And we're very proud of them for doing that and the information and data that they gleaned from our first trial at CBG. And then the next phase, it's really being aware of, and this is where the innovative part comes in and getting out of the mindset that we're just an airport. We have so much more to contribute to the community and in turn, understanding what the community brings to us. And this is a very unique picture. Uh, naturally, we're looking at you know the, the human form and the heart. What's the importance there? It does go get, and get into mobility. We learned, and I'm fortunate from a family member, that we learned that there is a new procedure. It's an LVAD, left ventricular assistive device. It is a heart pump. 
So that heart pump is keeping people alive. What was originally intended just to be a stopgap until a patient received a heart transplant now has become a life-giving and life-sustainable device. So individuals are actually living on this device and no longer in need of a heart transplant or they're simply not eligible. However, what that means is, and you can see by this form, yes, that heart is, is hidden, of course, underneath our skin, but notice the packs on either side and the white device beneath. That is keeping this individual alive. Those packs on the side are batteries. The, uh, the white portion is the actual pump. So very unique set of circumstances. Again, why do we care? We brought in our uh, partners at Christ Hospital to help educate the TSA and our own staff so that they understood completely of what was happening at all given times from that perspective. Why? Because it truly looks like the individual is wearing a bomb vest. And if the TSA were to disrupt any of those functions, literally, it means a life and death situation. So trying to educate and, and expound upon and really push this technology into other working partners to make sure that they're collaborating with us. And then on that curation front, with the curation and individuals like the heart pump type situation, they're limited in how far that they can actually walk. They may, may need that additional assistance that we're familiar with. So now we're looking at our friends from uh, Sky Squad. Sky Squad is a recent, recent launch. Laurel mentioned something like this in her presentation, that curated experience. And essentially it is a program for pay where an individual can reserve a concierge to meet them at the curb front that will escort them all the way through to their gate. And they will assist in carrying baggage um, assist with children, and frankly, that's where they started. They started on the family front and have since grown into elderly hospitality and supportive needs, understanding that not everyone can carry their baggage long distances. Um, so an incredible support arm and really embracing that. Why is CVG embracing it? Because we recognize that some of the services provided today are underwhelming, and they're just not to the level of customer satisfaction that we would expect. And from a payment perspective, it's no longer waiting for the next available attendant. Yes, there is a payment structure. However, it's a guaranteed product delivery and an expansion upon the typical services that may be offered. Again, that's from our team at uh, Sky Squad. And then the next element, some of you, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you may have seen this device, the orange device that's following the individual. Notice that it has bags in it, and that is truly legitimate. And so here's yours truly with my carry-on bag, walking up to what's known as Jita. Jita is built by Piaggio Fast Forward. I put my carry-on bag inside Jita and press the button twice, and Jita comes alive and becomes my personal robotic concierge taking my bag to the gate. So imagine individuals, again, that's it's difficult to be mobile to begin with, but also from a perspective of just simply the weight to pull. So we're moving into the direction of, and again, imagine the Sky Squad team, a group of individuals that are supporting your needs, but also robotics that are doing or functioning in the same manner. And then this is the next robot. The next iteration is, while it not might not carry a carry-on bag, it's actually carrying product. This one in particular is carrying a Tide stick, so a stain remover stick. We worked with Procter & Gamble, who's based in Cincinnati, um, to actually trial what the customer experience would be as far as robotic interaction for purchasing items, goods and services, food, et cetera. Why is this important? Especially in COVID times, we're finding that individuals obviously are frankly frightened to walk away from their gate. They don't necessarily want to be exposed more than what's necessary, and there's limited food options. What if we took those food options and delivered it straight to the gate? And longer term, what if we had the capability, if it's not food, to just deliver any type of product? You order it on your phone, the robot comes to a designated spot next to your gate, you grab your item, and often, often running both the robot and you go. So back to the PRM, the reduced mobility aspect is we're looking for consumers 
that again have those those limitations that we can bring consumerism straight to their feet and avoid them having to experience difficulties. This technology is brought to us by Ellie Port and Autonomy. They're a fantastic group of individuals as well as my team. Uh, we're very small, uh, but we managed to do some tremendous things. That's just the experience on the PRM front. Um, we have our hands in so many other elements and we're excited to continually show and share what the future looks like for everyone uh, going forward. Roberto and William, uh, back to you. Back. Thank you William. so much. Uh, that was, uh, obviously, uh, we didn't have an incredible amount of time. And I think, Roberto, we could have probably done another another half hour 45 minutes just on all of the innovation that they're doing uh at your airport brian absolutely amazing thank you uh roberto yeah first of all on on that note we have a brian you're still there yeah <laughs> we have a comment from the floor it's not a question it's a comment it's very impressive the extent you have gone to ensure staff as well as staff are well informed of all situations and the collaboration with the medical experts. So that's a Thank you so much. That, that means quite a bit to us. And then I believe you answered this in, in your presentations, but I'll put it to you anyways. Uh, Brian, good morning. At your checkpoints, do you have dedicated ADA lines or do you have a direct access queue into all the, all the lanes? We have both, actually. Uh, that line, um, you couldn't quite see it in the photo that we share, but it is a dedicated ADA access line straightforward. But in the event that we ever have that straightforward challenge, any of our lanes are ADA accessible. And then one that it's right up your sleeves. What is the strategy to encourage airports to adopt the suggestions and have kind of consistent service offering for PRMs across airports in the world? So twofold. Uh, number one, demonstrating that it can be done. All too often, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, that sounds really complicated. And I think as, as I've shared with yourself and William, we really don't have responsibility for the wheelchair contract, though that falls on the airlines currently, but we totally understand our role as the airport to be an ombudsman and to continually make sure that the product is improved. Now, outside of that, we found part two is there are other industries that are watching us very, very closely for what it is that we're doing, not only on COVID recovery, but imagine ballparks, arenas, um, you name it, public, large public venues that are trying to figure out how do I help my consumer going forward? And to Laurel's point, recognizing that Individuals that have um, limited abilities are definitely a consumer marketplace to be had. Uh, so we have to start changing our logic and thinking. As William said, you know, we could have had a, an hour and a half slot for you and, and, and still be, <laughs> be there listening <laughs> until the very last word. Thank you again, Brian, and have a good day. Good day to you. In, in Likewise. Kentucky. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, William. Great. Well, with that, um, we will uh, we will move on. Uh, next up, we have the Accessibility Awards. I'm very excited to hear uh, from the three uh, submissions that uh, that we're about to see. Um, and Roberto, can you please uh, share with us what we have in store for this uh, for this presentation? Uh, in in um, in a few moments, we're going to play three short videos. They're about four minutes each. And each of the of the three airports submitted a video to showcase what are their ideal solutions for assistance at airports. Uh, after after the videos, uh, we will have a short campfire with Emilia De Santis, who is terminal manager at Napoli Calcutta International Airport. Christina Smith, Smith, customer service and accessibility executive at John Lennon Liverpool Airport, and Nazareno Ventola, CEO at Guglielmo Marconi Airport. Bologna. So um, we will have a short campfire and during these 10 minutes where we will discuss together with uh, our friend uh, Martin Sibley and, and, and the three airports, uh, attendees will have a pop-up window showing up and they will be able to vote for the solution they think is the best. 
Right after then, uh, we will collect all the votes and almost immediately we will announce who is the winner of this year award. So I would like to start with the videos now, if possible. Fantastic. Hello and welcome to Liverpool John and Airport. I'm I'm the Customer Services and Accessibility Executive here at the airport. And today I want to share with you an initiative where we've been working on developing a dementia awareness module. First of all, I want to share with you a little bit of a background about Liverpool John Lennon Airport. In 2019, we carried over 5 million passengers with flights to over 70 destinations in the UK and Europe. Known as an award-winning, faster, easy, friendly airport of choice for passengers from across the northwest of England and North Wales. 96% of all our passengers pass through security in less than 10 minutes. We were the only UK airport to receive a five-star OAG on-time performance rating in 2019, one of the UK's best on-time performance records. 2019 British Travel Awards voted as best UK airport for its size. Our vision is to be the north of England's most accessible airport, focusing on the needs of those passengers often deterred from travelling by air due to a range of disabilities and improving the services we offer to those who already travel with us. Working with partners from a diverse range of disability organisations, we host accessibility forums, we engage with organisations working with members who may not travel at this time. We host open days for passengers and tailored visits for individuals and groups. And we develop and provide targeting training for airport and airline colleagues. Working with Thread Dementia, who are one group who've worked with us for several years, we identified that dementia awareness was limited to those colleagues who have personal experience, maybe with a family member or a friend. Working with Thread and Liverpool City Council, we collaborated to create a training module giving an insight into dementia and the challenges air travel can bring. Limited to a one hour duration, it was created and presented by Tommy and Paul, who both have dementia and it provides a unique insight into their lives and travel experience. The outcomes of creating this model mean that a series of trainings to reach as many colleagues as possible has been delivered to date. We're both working ongoing to promote the module as ma in many ways as possible. Some of you at the British and Irish Airports Expo in 2019 will record a promotional video I showed at the time. The guys are almost also working with the BBC and local radio stations. Our airport and aviation partners now support this training as well, including our EasyJet based teams. It's a two way learning dialogue with airport and airlines to improve the passenger experience and further develop training. One thing I'd like to leave with you in Tommy's words. Many people think that dementia is all about memory loss. If that was the case, those with dementia would walk around with a notepad and a zictophone. Dementia is way much more. Thank you. Aeroporto Amico a video guide about Naples International Airport for people affected by autism spectrum disorder. Welcome to Naples Airport. This video will show you how to navigate the airport before you take off. The airport can be reached by bus, taxi or car. The multi-storey car park right by the airport entrance has free stands reserved for special needs on the ground floor you will see a lot of cars and buses outside the airport. You will also see people going in and out of the airport through sliding doors. 
You may hear sudden noises of traffic, horns, voices, carry-on wheels and airplane engines. Once inside the terminal, you can check out the board with departure times. You will see signs and videos with ads, escalators and people walking around. You will hear people talking, the noise of carry-on wheels, music playing and special messages coming from the speakers announced by a signal. You will get excited, but always stay calm next to your assistant. On the right, follow the signs for special assistance room. From now on, you will have access to a special path made just for you. An airport operator will give you a VIF, very important flyer badge, that will help you through the process, from the check-in to boarding. The special assistance room is a welcoming and safe place. The staff there are very helpful. With the help of your assistant, you will reach the check-in desk and after a fast check-in, you will receive your boarding pass. You will see other people waiting in line and TV screens showing images and information. You will hear voices, the noise of the carry-on wheels and special messages announced by a signal. The check-in procedure takes only a few minutes Soon, it will be your turn and you will quickly reach the security area. You will have to take off your jacket, belt, watch and sometimes also your shoes. You will have to put all these objects in the plastic bags together with your backpack and cell phone. You will walk alone through the metal detector that may make a sound if you have any metal objects still on you. If you hear a sound, follow the instructions from the security staff. Security is very important for your peace of mind and for all passengers. The security crew is very nice and will help you. After the security check, you will find the boarding area with many shops, cafes, restaurants and comfortable chairs. It is almost time to board. Head to Sala Mika to complete your boarding procedure and wait for your special care vehicle that will take you right by the airplane stairs. On the runway, the noise of the airplane engine will be louder. Get in the car to reach the airplane. You are excited and happy. Always stay close to your assistant. The journey is about to begin. You will be one of the first ones to get on board. You will be welcomed by a flight assistant and shown your assigned seat. Follow the instructions by the flight attendants. Your handbag will be stored in the overhead compartment. Sit down, fasten your belt and wait until the boarding is completed. During takeoff, you will hear a very loud noise coming from the engine. Everything is ready. You are finally taking off. It's going to be a wonderful experience. Enjoy your flight.
Thank you very much. Uh, I hope attendees enjoyed the videos. And while we discuss with the presenters, we are going to um, we are going to open the votes. So you can immediately start voting. Uh, there is a poll, I believe. And I just saw it come up. There we go. So you can vote for the solution that you've seen that you think is the best one. And hopefully we're going to see you soon. Now we're waiting for our presenters. It seems that, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Roberto, that the poll has taken away our video. Is that correct? Yeah, it looks okay. like, uh, it looks like, okay, then we run the poll and when we right. see that the votes are, are more or less in, we are going to start with our panelists. And of course, Great. panelists and organizers cannot vote. <laughs> no, panelists and organizers don't vote. And um, we will, I think, um, given that um, that we can't have the video, if everybody could go ahead and uh, do their voting in the next minute, that would be fantastic. We are already at 64% of the attendees casting their votes, so it's progressing very nicely and smoothly and fast. Great. And the big question will be, who will it be? Who will it be? We're exactly. not going to say until after the campfire, though. We're not going to announce it right away. Right. It's probably a good idea not to, to announce it right off the bat. Exactly. Um, while, we're, while we're waiting, I, I did want to touch on a couple of areas just so that everybody has an idea of who's joining us uh, today. Um, there are more than 81 uh, different uh, attendees that have joined us from uh, the assistive services, the uh, service providers at uh, airports. We have, uh, we're very excited to see that this year uh, over 45 uh, airlines uh, have, have joined us. And, and a really interesting this thing this year that we saw, and, and it's really uh, quite special, is that um, we have uh, with us uh, this year more than 33 uh, civil aviation uh, and authorities uh, that have, have joined us. And, um, and of course, over, over uh, I think, 90 airports. So uh, just an incredible uh, group of people. And I, I, for one, really applaud everyone for taking the time out and being part of this event. Yes, William, and I think this is testament to the fact that uh, one of the uh, good byproducts of the pandemic it was to remind that every stakeholder, we, we can get out of this if we work together. And, and we can see that, you know, we're sharing the same goals, we're sharing the same problems, but also we want to find common solutions to, to move forward, to move past this uh, crisis. And the fact that all stakeholders are participating and, and are coming together is testament to, to this new, uh, newly found uh, way forward. Exactly. Great. Well, I, I think- uh, We're going to close the voting in about one minute and 30 seconds, so we can then move to the panel. So please cast your votes now, if you haven't done so yet. <laughs> Do it right There's this moment. What, what percentage are we at now? Uh, on, on the, <laughs> in this, in this, um, in this uh, voting session. But I think it's, and, and again, this I believe is the first time ever that attendees to a conference can, uh, to, to a special assistance conference, uh, have the, uh, the possibility to, to cast a vote for the solutions they believe are uh, the best ones for, for passengers uh, with special needs or passengers require assistance. So it, it is, uh, it is again, innovation, but is is a sense that uh, the, the the people that are watching are, are really interacting and are being synergic to the point that they express their views. Exactly. And I think that, um, that this 
this uh, moving into the next segment here where we where we have the representatives uh, from the airports live and we're able to um, have this campfire discussion and um, I hope that uh, we'll have an opportunity to bring in some of uh, the attendees as well towards the end. That's that's true. So we have five seconds to go for the voting and then it's over. Four. Two seconds. Okay, we close the votes now. Close the votes and bring up the presenters. Wow, look at that. Wow, we're all here. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Uh, I would like to have, you know, for the sake of variety, since me and William have been speaking the whole day, uh, I would like to uh, to hand uh, hand uh, the questions to Martin. Okay, thank you, Roberto, and uh, congratulations to the three speakers and your amazing initiatives at the airports. I'm uh, on tender hooks as to who's won now. Want to get get to this result? I'm sure you do as well. But um, as Roberto said, we're just going to have a a little chat just to, to hear from all of you um, a little bit further, having all seen the, the video. And of course, best of luck with with the, the awards and the results coming soon. So, Christina, we'll come to you first. Um, again, congratulations, amazing work you've been doing there. I think what, what really struck me um, from your video there was the way that you had involved uh, users. Yeah, the, the customer had very much been consulted and spoken to and helped you know bring to life what, what some of the barriers but also the solutions it'd be great just to hear a little bit from you how so how you decided that was important but more so how you went about actually doing so so um in the uk a lot of a lot of the airports well all of us airports we very much engage with different disability groups um and we try to reach out to as many groups as possible but we also find that quite a lot of groups reach out to us and the guys from thread dementia we've been working with was set for several years now and they basically wanted to share their own personal life experiences but also their travel experiences and something quite dear to my heart my mother is has the is in the advanced stages of dementia she was a travel industry professional and after early retirement she traveled extensively she traveled for many years in the earlier stages of having dementia because she was a dementia denier there's so much taboo for her to admit that she had dementia she traveled in the latter years with family members mainly myself and I saw firsthand the issues that she had. So when the guys actually came to us and said, you know what, we want to share our experiences more. How can we do it working together? We decided that if we could create a module to train our airport colleagues and airline okay. colleagues to see life through the eyes of someone with dementia and travel experience, it would be so much more meaningful. So that's that. That's basically what we did, and these guys are just amazing. Can't wait till it's in vid, full video format that we can lit, literally share with everyone. Brilliant. Yeah. No, it's uh, you know, I think in in disability sort of rights and inclusion, the nothing about us without us tagline is so important from the sort of social political change element. But I think more and more we're understanding when we look at the business case of inclusion that generally a good business speaks to its stakeholders and its customers and it's no different with disabled people as well so thank you for that christina and emilia i think um again congratulations for being a finalist fantastic initiatives going on um you may remember in my talk earlier i talked about the need for information to be given more creatively and you know sort of different ways of doing it i think it really struck me with your video how it gave, obviously I think it was more targeted towards um, the sort of neurodiverse community possibly um, in terms of a general audience, but even so it generally gave that, that reassurance of the customer journey. So it'd be great just to hear a little bit more about um, sort of what made you to go, you know, chose to go down that route and to do a more sort of creative, reassuring uh, piece of information for passengers. 
Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, of course, I want just to point out that this video uh, dates back to 2017, so you don't see any COVID measure in place, yeah. which of course are in place at Naples Airport, to just to be here for everybody. Um, this, uh, this project was launched by ANAC, the uh, Italian CAA, back in 2017. And once we were uh, invited to, to join, we were very happy to, uh, to participate in this important program. Um, and uh, strangely, also in our case, uh, like in uh, Christina's uh, example, um, one of our colleagues, who is the mother of an, an autistic child, she decided to launch this project. And uh, the child you see in the video is uh, actually her son. And uh, it was, you know, made from somebody who really knows what it means to uh, live with a, a person with autism and what uh, is behind, you know, the fears to um, be in a, an environment so crowded and so difficult to approach like the airport means and so she decided to um, launch a video and also a video guide and also a brochure where we really try to uh, make these people understand what it means to um, be at the airport and they can uh, book a visit uh, before the, uh, the journey uh, contacting us by email or by um, you know uh, a phone call and they will be uh, they will do the same route you've seen in the video so that they can understand which kind of uh, you know noises which kind of lights you will see what kind of uh, um, you know external factors in your journey you will you will uh, leave once you get at the airport okay yeah no that's fantastic thank you well um we'll find last but not least we move on to Nazarino and I just want to clarify that the topics that I'm sort of asking and the questions I think they all overlap I think there's lots of these points in all of your uh, initiatives and your projects but obviously I just want to focus in on a few key areas for all of you. So watching your, your video, Nazarino, there was definitely a, a technology um, team you know, jumping out at me. Um, I, I noticed there was a, someone moving around on sort of a wheelchair, a power chair advice. And I thought for a second the assistant staff had jumped a ride on the back of it. And then I realized it was the way they were actually transporting the, the person more efficiently. But um, just to talk about technology, and sort of uh, how you get the culture of your staff to embrace change. It would be lovely just to hear your thoughts on that area, please. Yes, good afternoon and thank you for, for this opportunity. As you said, uh, we have, we have been embracing technology and innovation since uh, some years now, at least since uh, 2013, when we actually changed our strategy and uh, with the passenger at the center of, of our business strategy. And within this strategy, of course, technology is something which really helps easing passenger experience and passenger journey. And during the years, we've been developing different solutions. The one that was shown in the video about uh, the health phone that is connects the passenger, the PRM passenger with, with our staff is one of those solutions, not the only one. What we've been trying to do is trying to understand what our passenger need and uh, so and uh, also looking for solutions which can be actually uh, nice to be lived by by your passenger even in difficult situations like sometimes a prm experience can be and if you look at uh, uh, the video also you can see as for naples that there were a lot of people in the video uh, the people staff without masks and passengers we use them in some pictures and some videos from last year but because we think and we hope that this normality will come back very soon and on this track to, uh, towards this new normality, we wanted to show how the airport is in normal conditions, of course. Now the situation is, is very much different. But what is not different is that um, the dedication of our staff, as, 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 as you also said, I mean, we have almost 40 people working on the PRM assistance and they are very, very, very motivated. And uh, in terms also number of assistants, just to give you a couple of numbers, uh, between 2012 and 2019, our passenger grew by 6.9% and our assistances grew by more than 10%. So from 3.8 to 4.8 assistances per uh, thousand passengers. So the passenger, let's say, uh, also with, uh, uh, you know, learned how to use our services and also learn how to use our, our solutions and our technological solutions. And uh, even if we're a small, let's say, regional airport, mid-sized regional airport, uh, we almost reached 10 million passengers last year. Of course, this year is totally different. 
uh, we are engaged in uh, helping our passenger having a, the best possible passenger experience under these conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roberto. Thank you, Martin. To you. You, you're, you're a fantastic yeah. griller. <laughs> you're the official of griller for, for conferences. <laughs> but now we have the results. And it is my great privilege to announce the winner of the first ever OSEON Accessibility Award for Airports. And this is, the winner is Bologna International Airport. Congratulations, Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Bravo. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you very much for participating. I believe Ozion will send you something <laughs> to remark that you won the award. Of course. <laughs> An award. And, congrats, and congrats to my colleagues from uh, for, um, Liverpool and, and Naples for, I think, we're all doing a great job in helping our passengers and our customers and I, I, I'm, I'm sure it will be doing even better in the future thank you and this is thank and you. this is what's important is that everybody is committed to provide customers with disabilities persons with disabilities the best possible service and even in these difficult times we all know that this effort has not uh, receded but it's always there and and the the fact that uh, the passenger grows even in these difficult times, the passenger growth for PRMs outpaces uh, the growth for, for normal passengers, for mainstream passengers. We are, we are grateful of, of the great work that all airports are doing in this field. Now, before handing over to William, I would like to uh, say a special thank you to our hidden heroes, the guys and, 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 and a lady who worked flat out for the past two weeks and, and all day today behind the scenes to make this possible. And I'm talking about Kevin, Alexa, Thomas and Jan. Guys, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for doing the great job. And now over to you, William. Fantastic. And I and I would like to sort of echo what uh, Roberto was, was just saying. You know, the, the, the effort I think um, around this awards is to really share and bring, bring the solutions, as many solutions uh, to the forefront as possible. And all of the work, um, you know, we, we visit airports uh, during normal times, uh, pretty much nonstop throughout the year. And what I always find is that in all of these different aspects, uh, it is incredible the work and the effort that, uh, that everyone, not just the airports, but the, the airlines and the service providers are all putting into uh, these various programs. So I really, I, I applaud all of you, and I really do look forward to uh, taking this uh, again to uh, to the conference for next year as well. So thank you for for uh, being the first, as it were. Thank you. Great. Good. Um, I'll move on to tomorrow, Roberto. Yes, definitely. Uh, the floor is yours, William. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. And I see a. The webcam was closed by the organizer. Hold on one second, I'll reactivate it. Sorry about that. I'm the organizer and somehow I turned myself off. Um, anyway. You had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roberto, what an incredible day. Really, um, I would like, as you did, I would like to thank everybody uh, for attending. I think that it is only uh, by bringing everyone together and bringing the solutions together that, that we actually can move uh, the ball forward. So um, I know that we spend a lot of time uh, celebrating the presenters, which we should, and we thank them tremendously, but it really is this coming together of community that, that brings these solutions and spreads them out. I, I, I think I've mentioned a couple of times the, the, the geographic impact of, of the event this year, and it's really stunning to think that we're able to take a solution, an idea from one part of the world and wrap it all the way around to Australia or South Africa or uh, um, you know, Mexico, Brazil. Uh, it, it's really incredible. Um, and luckily, we're recording the sessions, so uh, we will be able to come back and share those uh, because I think that there were, uh, especially in some of those sessions, so many ideas that were coming out it would be great to go back and we will be um, adding those subtitles uh, to those to those presentations as well. 
Um, please, everyone, set your clocks for tomorrow's deep dive session. Um, it'll begin uh, right here using the same link that you use today, uh, 2 p.m. CET or Paris time. Um, it's going to be a highly insightful and interactive session, and I promise, absolutely promise, not too technical. I know that Roberto doesn't like the too technical, so we'll just go lightly into technical and more around the effects uh, that, uh, that the data has on the overall uh, operations and service for passengers um, with reduced mobility. Uh, I, again, I will be there, William, I will be there uh, virtually next to you, reminding you to speak human when, <laughs> when, when things get out of hand, but That's hopefully right. they will not. That's right. That's great. And I'd also like to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, Jan, Toma, Kevin Knight, uh, Alexa Hink, our entire staff. Um, this endeavor that we have undertaken this year um, we took extremely seriously, and I am just over the world happy with the the fact that we were able to tie everything together, bring it together, and and share all of this uh, with you. So with that, Roberto, I'd uh, like to thank you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. It's been a Great. pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you, really. This is the end of the first day of the Airport PRM Leadership Conference. And we look forward to you joining us tomorrow. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. <laughs>